Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Is the intro? All right, perfect. Thank you for coming to my talk on, uh, as Leon said, applying research in stream processing for fraud detection. So, uh, first of all, who is this person here uh, speaking to you? Uh, my name is Pedro Cardoz, as I was introduced, graduated from FILP uh, in computer science. I have a master's in it in 2016. And some ob obligatory tidbits about me is I love sports, but my main thing is surfing. And if any of you guys also like it, please come talk to me. Let's hang out. We have my things right here, so that's perfect. Uh, I also love uh, going to movies and live music, particularly uh, in the topic of drinking German beer. Yeah, I, I don't know why, it just happens. And uh, generally, just having a good time. Now, about my professional career. Right now, uh, I've been at Feedside since 2017 and officially a data engineer in the research team. And for those of you who are interested, uh, here you have my uh, social networks. But I also think that you have this in the, the SPT calendar. Now, let's go into the technical stuff. Oh. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, so, stream processing. Uh, this is what I want to talk to you about, and this is the topic of my, my talk. So, first of all, um, who here has ever thought of stream processing like this? If it's either real or if it's an actual buzzword, what is the use case? Why is it useful? Uh, is, is there actually software that performs this? At some scenarios, I actually thought at some time, point in time that, yeah, I, I don't know if stream processing is actually a thing. But let's, let's try to be a little bit formal about it. Um, one definition that you could provide is that stream processing as an idea is the notion of trying to process an unlimited amount of data with finite resources, whether this is disk, RAM, CPU, network, so on and so forth. Well, one might typically think that, well, if it's infinite data, you cannot fit infinite data in finite resources, so that's not really possible. Well, that's true, and that is a problem uh, or a hard constraint in the field, but there are some workarounds for that. Particularly, usually what you want to do when you're processing data is you want to apply some scalar functions to it. You want to do sums, averages, uh, counts, max, mins, these sorts of things, which is essentially taking uh, a collection of data and summarizing that into one data point. You might also want to do, and as Sam mentioned, uh, temporal queries. You might want to know for uh, time series visualizations um, what is the behavior of your pattern over time. Sometimes uh, you might even want to do things like count distincts and uh, membership questions about your data. Have I seen this element in the past in some given amount of time? And that is sometimes is not that trivial to do because it has some memory constraints associated with it. For that, you can use sketches. There's also the notion of uh, infinite pulse responses. And if you don't know what this is, don't worry about it. I will talk about this later on. Uh, obviously, you could all, it doesn't hurt to do good technology choices. You probably don't want to do stream processing on a Raspberry Pi or with five megabytes of RAM. It's probably not going to work. And distributing your loads, especially doing partitions by your group by elements, is something that is very important and highly useful. And finally, uh, trying to offload uh, state into disk if you're doing stateful queries. It's also an option and something that you seriously have to consider at some points at scale. So why would you even want to do this? Well, um, when you want to do stream processing, it's usually because you want to process a lot of data that is coming in really, really fast, and you need a response very, very quickly. Such scenarios can include high-frequency trading, fraud detection, quick stream analysis, signal, image, video uh, processing, IoT monitoring, or you could be Google and doing advertisement auctioning. Uh, in all honesty, there's a hell of a lot more that you could do, and this is simply limited by your imagination and um, by your notion or your urgency to get responses to your questions. So if you think, like me, that stream processing does have a position and does have an objective, that matches, what solutions would you want to use? Well, there are several of them, and these are just the most common. Uh, most of them are open source um, to use. However, there are a lot of options out there. And having so many options, you could easily feel like this. I know that in my particular scenario, I do, uh, or I did, 
And uh, how do you distinguish one from the other? How do you decide which technology is the right technology for you to use? Well, as usual, it depends, as everything in the industry. And it depends on a lot of factors. And here are some of them. The main points of which are, do you require per event accuracy? Or are you OK with micro-batching responses? Do you, are you using or do you need to have stateful queries or can they be stateless? Uh, do you need fault tolerance? Do you need distribution? Do you need high throughput? And if so, what is your scale for high throughput? Do you need it to be adaptable? Do you need it to be scalable? Do you need to have a large community around it? I mean, if you don't know anything about stream processing, probably you'll need a technology that works in that scenario. All right, can you hear me now? Perfect. Sorry. So, well, usually the answer to this is selecting one is extremely hard, and it depends on your use case. Uh, for example, in my very particular one at Feedzine, um, okay, we have some technical difficulties. Good ones. Uh, I saw it was alive. Once, uh, right. I can see it down here, but at least on top. All right. Now I don't see anything at all. So, all right. So, um, as I was saying, my particular use case for stream processing is at Feedzai, and uh, at a, it's already a, a reasonably old company where they had their own custom uh, system to do this, something called P Kernel, and the reason why they even got into stream processing is that. For the fraud detection scenario, there are a couple of things that are particularly useful. Let's see if I can, perfect. All right, so suppose uh, you want to purchase, uh, I don't know, a piece of clothes on, your, on the local shop, and then you go into Amazon and you buy a book. And suddenly you look in your, in your app store, in your phone, and you want to buy some application. All of these are transactions which uh, probably make sense because they're within the boundaries of what you usually uh, spend with your card. Suppose that sometime afterwards someone does a really massive uh, bank movement with your account. That's probably weird and that is probably a good indication of fraud. So um, our use case for this was uh, to create something, profiles, which are the notions of temporal aggregations uh, over some set of fields. Think of this essentially as SQL over time, where we want to do things like the average count of transactions over the last week, or you want to do the sum of amounts that you performed in a month and compare that with some period um, before. Why, why is this good? Well, typically because these are very, very good features for machine learning models to prevent fraud. Because here we are essentially encoding into a model the history, the pattern uh, of your card, right? So typically the way that you do this uh, is you have the notion of windows, but these windows have uh, some issues. One of those issues is memory constraints. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I worked in a project called uh, Lightway Profiles, which was essentially how do we make computations or streaming analysis over temporal windows less memory intensive. So for some context, suppose that uh, you have this graph over time and the circles at the top represent events, right? Uh, your movement, your balance doesn't really matter. And the window, the uh, dark blue uh, area, is essentially the time window that you want to compute your profile over. One of the, the key thing to take from here is that events that are within this region uh, cost m memory, right? There's a linear cost to your definition of windows. Sorry. And this has an issue because these naive sliding windows, uh, they have th this overhead of storing events in these windows, a linear memory cost. So if you're, for example, computing some profile over one week of data, that is completely different from storing over six months of data. You have a massive increase here. And there's also, in a naive implementation, an overhead of updating and expiring events which come in and out of windows. You constantly have to check for every single event that you see in your window, okay, is this event going in or is it going out? 
and you have to handle that. That's CPU cycles that you're losing. That's latency lost or latency gains, I mean. Um, and uh, we have a lot of these. There's a lot of profiles that are being used, such uh, things like counts, sums, averages, count distincts, so on and so forth. And the idea to these sliding windows is instead of that, let's use something called exponential moving averages for these scalar aggregations and for count distincts, use hyperlog log. What does this look like? Uh, suppose or try to imagine the state uh, for, for example, a sum over a card in a five week period as that dark blue circle, right? <laughs> An emma uh, can be classified in the state uh, of this, of the whole emma, can be represented as a ramp instead of as, this, as the rectangle in the naive implementation. When a new event comes in, what you do is you take that older, uh, that older circle and you suppress that. You, do, you essentially multiply that by an exponential factor, hence the name exponential moving, and you add uh, the new event that's incoming. The suppression that you perform, it depends on the time difference between the last time you updated an event and this new one. That can be essentially given by this mathematical operation. Essentially the state at some time t0 equals the state at t1, where t1 was the previous time that an event went in for this profile, multiplied by an exponential factor, which depends on the time differences, plus the new event. The great thing about this, and don't really worry about the math if you can't interpret it, is that nowhere in the formula is there a reference to the number of windows, which means that you can compute a profile, and computing this profile, whether that's one week, one month, 10 years, it has the exact same linear cost. At least in theory, this would be massive in, in uh, the use case. This means theoretically that you have massive uh, or even perfect memory savings. However, that's all really nice in theory, but in practice, it's always a little different. The reason being that Emma's or these sort of profiles, they're everlasting. Their value is never really zero. There is this long tail um, which never goes away. And the real implication of this is that you would never expire profiles. This would mean that for every single group by value that you've seen in your profile, you would have to store all of it. And that could potentially mean, okay, so I lose my, my memory savings, my hypothetical ones. Well, not really, because you could do something like the, uh, define an implementation of a key time to live. This is the notion of, okay, if I have not seen or if I have not received an event for this specific group by, and that could be a card, could be a country, could be an email or an IP, it doesn't really matter, whatever you're grouping by. If I have not seen any event for this particular value over some amount of time, then I'll just discard it. This means that, okay, you still have to save in memory all the group by values that you've seen, but the state that you're keeping is constant for that specific key. <coughs> this, uh, also provides a very good benefit that updates and expires, at least relative to the old implementation where you had to, for every single event, try to see, <coughs> is there anything that's being updated or is there anything going in? In this case, you always update. So it's much more predictable. So you might ask, okay, so did this work? Well, before I give you an answer to that, uh, let me just explain to you that there are at least two things that we should consider or three actually. <coughs> One is latency. The scenario here for the streaming engine has to be in real time, so we can't really slow down, or we can't be worse, there cannot be a latency regression. In memory, that is naturally what we wanted to optimize for. And lastly, uh, from a machine learning perspective, if we're using these profiles as features, do they actually help? Or at least do they not, uh, they must not provide a regression in machine learning performance. Well. On the last point, uh, what we found out is that Emma profiles or features do not at all degrade machine learning performance. At anything, in some very specific scenarios, they actually increase, even if only very slightly, to the point of being negligible. So on that particular scenario, we're good. On the perspective of latency, well, we tested this on a, an actual real data set that we have internally. Uh, 6.4 million events, 1.4, uh, sorry, yeah, 6.4 million events, approximately 1.4 million uh, different group buys, and 150 profiles. So 
a reasonable amount, and we had an event rate of 200 events per second. Our operator latency in blue for the very first graph uh, was uh, for regular operators. In red is the M operators. Be aware that here I'm showing you the mean and the high percentile, so two nines up to uh, five nines, because those are what break SLAs uh, in most cases, at least from an engineering perspective. And below you can see the improvement ratio. So the TLDR of it is that M operations are two to 10 times faster. So we're good on this. Not particularly what we wanted to emphasize, but great. This is even better if, uh, from what we had before. From a memory perspective, the scenario is a little bit murkier. It somewhat depends on the configuration, particularly of the time to live factor, which kind of makes sense. Because if I'm starting to store keys instead of it being a week, being five, being five months, and I expect still to save more memory, well, I'm kind of being unreasonable. Uh, but um, from our experiments with reasonable configurations, we're saving around 50% of memory, which if you have large enough clusters, this means a lot of money. So uh, on that end, we're good. And also, there's this very good side benefit that memory costs for um, profiles no longer depends on the number of events. So <clears throat> if I'm handling 100 different cards and I have one event, that's the exact same thing of having 100 different cards and 100 million events. In memory, it's OK, because we're only, only always updating a single entry, a single data structure, which is of constant size. So in conclusion, I think this is pretty fair to say. Great success, at least on this project. But that's what I did before. There are other projects that uh, I'm working right now, which are one of them, Railgun, which is essentially redesigning the kernel, redesigning the streaming engine that I'm working with, uh, simply because it was developed around 2010 and there are some requirements or some constraints which no longer make sense. And uh, we simply have new use cases for it. Specifically, trying to handle simultaneously incredibly large windows. And this could be one year, two years, 10 years sort of windows. With the same performance and with the same transparent manner to the user as one second windows. We just have to handle this wide range of windows and also trying to compute accurate count distincts over uh, these time periods with millisecond latency, because that's what we had before, and that's what clients were asking. So that's what I'm working right now. There's also the project Lightweight Data Monitoring, which is uh, in collaboration with the University of Porto. Uh, it's actually a master's, of which I'm a supervisor, uh, which is trying to use approximate aggregations, whether that's Emma profiles, hyperlog logs, count mins, boom filters, so on and so forth, to try to detect in real time shifting data patterns in your data uh, pipelines and try to understand whether we could use that knowledge to dynamically adjust the sizing of clusters and the hardware and the kind of operations that you're doing. So that's, that's what I have, uh, at least right now. And the idea here is that there is a hell of a lot more that you could do that the possibilities to be able to use uh, stream processing and the kind of advantages and responses to questions that you didn't know you had could actually be solved by this. So concluding, there are a lot of streaming engines out there, but sometimes you need something custom because it might not match particularly your use case or the very hard requirements that you have, which you might think at some point in time they're actually soft requirements. Uh, very few engines are actually distributed or do true event by event streaming. Usually they're micro batches. And this for most use cases is okay, but for some of them like high frequency trading, fraud detection, so on and so forth are not. You simply cannot use micro batching if you want to have a truly efficient solution. And additionally, uh, traditional approaches to sliding windows, they're prone to uh, event bursting and are memory intensive for which Emma-based features um, and profiles are actually a pretty cool solution and might work. They did um, in my experiments. They might also do for yours in your particular use cases. And finally, in spite of decades of research, there is still a lot to do here. And we are only limited by your um, 
um, sorry, by your understanding of the field and by your willingness to work in it. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much.